Hi, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology and the Carleton University Department of, of Geography and Environmental Studies. And I'm talking about the global methane budgets um, and gas hydrate dissociation. So when you're doing a budget, um, there are several different approaches you can take. You can do basically a top-down approach or you can do a bottom-up approach. So the top-down assessment you look at the total amount of methane in the atmosphere on a global or regional scale, and then you try to um, attribute um, certain fractions of that total methane change to various sources. So this, is, this does account for all of the methane present in the atmosphere at a given spatial scale, but it's not very detailed, and you, you might be making, there might be a lot of guesswork. So a bottom-up assessment tries to look at all of the different um, goes the other way. It looks at all the different sources and tries to come up with numbers from measurements, you know, flask measurements and uh, calculations and data, you know, on best estimates of what particular regions are producing in terms of the methane flux of the atmosphere. For example, rice paddies, or you look at uh, um, <coughs> wetlands or different regions, and then you add up all those numbers and you come up with a um, a number from which hopefully uh, matches close to the uh, to the uh, top-down approach. So basically, by doing these methods, um, the annual flux of methane to the atmosphere from all sources is about 555 teragrams per year. Um, so that's 10 to the 12 grams uh, per year. Um, if you want to put teragrams to gigatons, this is 10 to the 12th grams, giga is 10 to the 9th, gigatons, um, that would be 10 to the 9th tons, uh, ton is 1,000 kilograms, so that would be 10 to the 12th kilograms, or 10 to the 15th grams, versus 10 to the 12th grams for that. Um, so this would be about 0.555 uh, gigatons, if I've calculated correctly. Um, so the, uh, the total top-down estimate is, is smaller, but in the same ballpark as the bottom-up estimate. Um, so basically, um, how much of that is due to gas hydrate dissociation? Okay, so the first published estimates of the methane flux from the gas hydrate was a, varied between 0.12 to eight gigatons per year. Um, and this was done back in when the original estimate of a total of 11,000 gigatons of carbon in hydrates was estimated. Um, and this number is uh, the IPCC reports, you know, going through the years and et cetera. Uh, we often come up with numbers of five um, teragrams per year. Um, you know, there's a wide spread in these numbers. If it was five teragrams per year, it would take 400,000 years for a wholesale transfer of all the methane in place to go into the atmosphere. Um, obviously, um, so, you know, there, there's lots of um, uncertainty in these types of numbers. And that doesn't seem to, you know, that's, that's, you know, obviously the rate doesn't stay the same over long periods of time. Um, and how much of the methane would get into the atmosphere? Of course, the amount getting up into the atmosphere depends on the rate of rate that it's released at. Because there's these processes in the sediments and in the water column that remove methane, you know, when it's coming out at slow rate. But if you swamp out, if you got these large episodic pulses or release of methane, it would swamp out the ability of the soil, of the sediments and the water column to remove the methane before it went right up through the water column into the atmosphere. So, um, so here's some of the attributions of atmospheric methane to, the, to gas hydrate sources. Um, so we have five teragrams per year in this report here, you know, and five to, five to 
five or ten in the third IPCC. These numbers are pretty constant. There's not a lot of change, you know, that we're still talking about, you know, six here. So there hasn't been a lot of change in these reports. Um, and there, you know, but these reports aren't really based on observational evidence because there hasn't been such measurements. Um, there's lots of assumptions and things for how much gets up into the atmosphere. So this doesn't lend much um, confidence in these numbers. Um, now, there's also, um, so Shikova in 2010, so the Russian researchers um, talked about um, methane fluxes and, you know, and, and sort of they, they got something like eight teragrams per year, roughly, calculated flux from the East Siberian Arctic Shelf. Um, but they didn't attribute um, that flux to gas hydrates. That was uh, the total of a whole bunch of different potential sources. Um, so, you know, we do know that the reservoirs dwarf um, the other, uh, the, the reservoirs, the amount of CO8 methane sequestered in, this, in the reservoirs, in the ocean sediments, it dwarfs the many other reservoirs that are in the Earth's system. But um, there's no direct evidence that the methane, that is, levels that are elevated are from this gas hydrate dissociation. But, you know, where else are they going to be from, I guess? Um, you know, there's some other sources, but, you know, the methane's coming from somewhere. So, so some of the ways of uh, you know, there's lots of challenges to how do you, how do you measure, um, how do you determine that the methane that's coming up is from, is from gas hydrates. So, um, you know, if you have a, if there, there's different ways that you can consider doing it. Um, for example, if you date the age of the methane, um, based on carbon, uh, 14 dating, for example, or some other elements. That are that are part that are in the methane sample iodine 129, then um, you can try to basically these type of studies suggest that the methane sequestered is usually older than the surrounding sediments, so this means that the gas likely migrated to that region. It wasn't formed in those sediments, um, and then but often the methane is too old to be dated by carbon 14 techniques because um, the half-life is too short for carbon-14, so you can only go back a certain distance, I don't know, what, 40, 50,000 years, something like that. Um, you can look at different chemical tracers um, in the, you know, that, so, so analyze the whole chemistry of the methane. There's other, other trace elements, and if you can match the, the ratio of these trace elements to some other region, you can maybe see where it's coming from, for example. Um, is another way of doing it, or you can look at stable isotopes, um, different ratios of stable isotopes to try to come up with numbers, but there's not definitive fingerprints that show us um, you know, the, the source of that methane. Okay, so, but also very important to consider is the, um, also very important to consider, just doing a time check here, Okay, so the methane's released, and then what happens to it? Like, what, what does it have? So when it's released, there's different physical, chemical, and biological sinks in the sediments and ocean waters that reduce the amount that goes up into the atmosphere. Okay, and the claim is that these sinks are so strong that there's likely very few locations on present-day Earth where the gas hydrate dissociation could release methane that reaches the atmosphere in any significant quantity. So how do they come up with that? Because that differs from uh, what I've thought for quite a while. So, um, <coughs> so here, um, you know, here's the seafloor getting deeper and you get different methane coming up into the water column, different fluxes, you've got a total flux going into the atmosphere of methane, 555 teragrams per year, 
that's compared to CO2 emissions, 8,300 plus or minus 700 teragrams, so much, much higher. Um, so the methane comes up, some of it is, is trapped in the, you know, it's released, some of it is broken down in the sediment, some of it goes into the water column as the bubbles rise, um, some of it's dissolved into the water column, and there's aerobic uh, bacterial decomposition here. There's anaerobic in the sediments. So we have all of these um, things that can possibly reduce it. So let's talk about the sediments. Um, so the strongest sink is the anaerobic oxidation of methane, methane, AOM. Okay, so there's a consortium of microbes in the sediments, and these microbes are coupled to sulfate reduction and this is in diffusion dominated regions. Um, so it's called the sulfate reduction zone and it's centimeters to meters just below the seafloor. So, uh, so basically the methane, if it's coming up in, through fissures or cracks or hydrates that are dissociating, then, then that gas comes up, it comes into this zone and a lot of it is broken down. This acts as a biofilter um, that stops the methane from actually reaching the seafloor and going into the water column. Um, so the estimate is that 80 to 90 percent of the estimated 400 teragrams per year of methane that reaches the sulfate reduction zone um, is consumed by the anaer anaerobic oxidation of methane, the AOM. Okay, if there's vigorous seepage, so if there's lots of methane coming up, um, then um, other regions, some show that you know, only 20% of it is consumed by AOM. So the amount that's consumed by this process is highly dependent on the rate at which it's released. So um, if there's rapidly ascending gases in bubbles, that can bypass this, the biofilter and go into the water column. Okay, so, so this is also, this process is also coupled to carbonate precipitation in shallow depths, okay, because uh, this process produces bicarbonates, which makes the water more alkaline and affects the rate at which the methane is broken up. Um, so this is a sink for methane released from the dissociating gas hydrates. Um, <coughs> okay, it would keep methane out of the water column and thus keep it out of the atmosphere. Now, what happens to the methane that actually bypasses this first sink and makes it into the water column? So, there's a couple different factors. First of all, um, you can get methane just to dissolve in the seawater. Um, and then it, it, it's, in, it's, it's dissolved into the seawater and so you have this, these bubbles coming up, and as the methane's taken out of the bubbles, the bubbles get smaller and smaller, and uh, eventually disappear, and the methane, so they don't make it up to the, to the surface. So it's called a bubble stripping process, and um, basically this would also remove lots of methane, but this is another process that can be saturated. Okay, so there's an example here, so I'll continue this, this discussion in the, in the next video. Thank you.